Welcome to Qualified Opinions, where we test the ideas and limits, the knowns and known unknowns around freedom and order in contemporary politics and society. We invite you to listen as we engage with leading and emerging thinkers across disciplines and issues who will sharpen our thinking on the topics shaping our discourse. The Republican chairman of the House Budget Committee made news recently when he announced that if Republicans are serious about fixing Washington's finances, they'll have to talk about raising taxes. That's what we're going to talk about today with my guest. I'm delighted to welcome Adam Michelle to the Qualified Opinion Podcast. Adam is a director of tax policy studies at the Cato Institute, where he focuses on analyzing the economic and budgetary effects of taxation in the U.S. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for having me on. So tell us a little bit about you and how you have uh, gotten to where you are and uh, to studying taxes. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think taxes in particular, I sort of fell into but fell in love with the area of uh, of policy because taxes touch sort of every everything in people's lives. If there's a tax angle to education, there's a tax angle to sort of broader economic growth, there's a tax angle to budgetary issues, as we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so uh, ultimately, that you get to I get to learn about something new uh, every day and sort of think about how uh, how how. The, the sort of way that the tax system is designed influences people's behavior. I sort of started my, my career at, the, at Mercatus uh, working, working with you uh, and Jason and the sort of uh, other folks over there. Uh, I was, spent some time at the Heritage Foundation, got my PhD from uh, George Mason in economics during that time and spent some time on the Hill at the Joint Economic Committee. And now I'm, now I'm here at Cato. So at the JEC, you were doing mostly tax issues or were you more of a generalist? Yeah, we covered sort of all current economic issues. I was the deputy staff director, so I was overseeing work in a lot of different spaces. Uh, we one of the main priorities of Senator Lee at, at the time was what he called the, the social capital project. So did a lot of uh, work in in that space. But it was also during the sort of high inflationary period, so we did a lot of work on inflation. Uh, and now I'm back working sort of almost exclusively on taxes. Well, so let's dive in. So Chairman Harrington is the chairman of the House Budget Committee, and he's the one who who brought up the fact that, you know, we're going to have to compromise. He said, it's only fair to have both revenue and expenditure on the table. Last time there was a fix to Social Security that addressed the solvency for 75 years. It was Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, and it was bipartisan. It had revenue measures and it had program reforms. That's just a reality. So can you can you actually set the stage and the background for why Chairman Harrington made these comments? Yeah, well, the sort of big picture background is the CBO projects that we're gonna have on average $2 trillion deficits over the next decade. Uh, that baseline sort of uh, un, unrealistically assumes that Congress is going to uh, is going to keep taxes low so that two trillion dollar figure is more like two and a half trillion if we assume that Congress isn't going to or is going to extend about 400 billion dollars in atoma- automatic tax increases that would happen in 2026 um, these are the sort of 2020 2017 tax cuts that uh, that were passed by Republicans. And so the, I think the other way of looking at this is if you look at just mandatory spending, things like Social Security, Medicare, uh, other health entitlements and interest expense, those these sort of automatic spending categories are, are projected to permanently surpass revenue raised by 2031, leaving everything else to be deficit financed. Uh, so the, the fiscal s- picture is is dire. And it's driven by this gap between revenues and and spending. Over the next decade, we're uh, we're projected to have revenues coming in a a little bit above the historical average of 17.5%, increasing slightly over time. But spending is projected to increase uh, much more quickly than both the economy and revenues, uh, averaging about 24% over time. And it's the gap between those two that creates the deficit and uh, and signals that something is fundamentally wrong with the way that Congress is uh, is budgeting. 
So in 2021, the U.S. had a $128 billion surplus. And today, as you said, we have a you know, $1.7 trillion deficit. It's going to be permanently above $2 trillion starting in a few years. Debt to GDP is close to 100% of GDP. That's three times what it was in 2001. How, how did that happen? Uh, <laughs> the... So I, th- I think you you the you, as you noted the the we had a budget surplus in the early early two thousands. This was revenue was at uh, sort of in for one year was at the historic high of twenty percent, but has fluctuated around the seventeen percent mark uh, since since then. But spending has has not. Congress has done a pretty good job of keeping tax revenue from from increasing faster than the economy, but they've done an abysmal job at keeping spending from increasing faster than the economy. Uh, and so it's the it's the systemic uh, and systemic gap between where spending is consistently higher than what Congress is willing to raise in revenue that that both gives us our our debt, but also uh, is the reason for the deficit, which is projected out into the future. So what you're saying is like we're spending more more money than we raise in revenue. So spending is a problem. Yeah, that, that's the uh, spending, spending, and spending growth is the is the driver of future deficits. I think there's a ultimately it sort of comes down to a normative question: How big do you want government to ultimately be? And if you think that the appropriate size of government is 25 percent of GDP, then you think revenue should be should then do you think that Congress has done a poor job at increasing taxes over time? And if I think you share the worldview that you and I do that that the federal government should be constrained and not perpetually grow over time, then it's a, it's a failure of constraining spending growth uh, over time. But the, 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 the problem is the difference between those uh, those two metrics. But so what do you uh, tell people who say, and we hear this all the time, right, uh, that tax cuts are the problem. The reason why we have the financial pro- like the deficits that we have today, it's all about, it was a 2001 tax cut. It's like basically when Republicans are in power, they cut taxes and that's why we're in this mess. Like, so for instance, like the, 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 the Trump tax cuts really are like, it's like everyone points to them as the reason, uh, not everyone, like a, a lot of people on the left point to them. It's a big part of the narrative of why we are in this mess. Yeah, I think if you look uh, historically, that's just simply not the case as I, as, as We've already pointed out revenue has been relatively stable over time. Uh, and even if you were to uh, sort of spool back to 2000 when revenue for one year hit 20% of GDP, sort of the highest mark in our recent history, the if you were to if Congress were to a, were able to sustain that 20% revenue of GDP number uh, sort of perpetually into the future, we'd still have deficits of about 8% of GDP in a few decades. The, the sort of uh, historic, keep having historically high revenues doesn't materially change our future deficit path under under the current budget. So the, what that tells you is this, we can sort of, we can talk about what the appropriate level of government is, but there's also a growth rate problem. The growth rate of spending is unsustainable. And the, and if we don't address that, the spending growing faster than than the economy over time, the I don't know what what we're talking about. There's no the, like that's that's the crux of the issue. It's uh, it's it's it, this is a spending fueled problem, and that's where the conversation ultimately needs to start. So the starting point is to uh, talking about basically addressing our debt problem, putting ourselves on a sustainable path, uh, closing our deficits, you think shouldn't actually focus on deficits, but should, uh, it, that confuses the uh, the conversation, but we should have first and foremost a conversation about the size of government. It seems that it's like, I mean, it makes sense to you and, and me, but it's, it's really not what's happening. Can you make the case for why we really should and why no conversation about sustainability or about raising taxes uh, should start before we have that conversation? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I think a focus on the deficit confuses sort of what we're talking about. Ultimately, politicians or voters need to have there there is some level of government spending that that is desirable and 
and that's the convert like how big the government is should be should ultimately be be the conversation we're having simply saying we need to close the deficit uh doesn't doesn't take into consideration whether or not the the size of the government should be 17 percent of gdp which is the revenue level or 22 23 percent of gdp which is the spending level or rising to uh to 25 28 percent of gdp over over the next several several decades so the, the ultimately that's the conversation we need to have and then and then we, you, can, you can discuss sort of how do you raise enough revenue to fund the size of the, the of government you want. And that conversation is also incredibly important because it's not just about what are we spending money on, but the th- those taxes have economic costs. They have costs of taking money out of people's pockets. Uh, and so you need to think about both the revenue and the spending side and, and ultimately what do you want government doing? What is the size and scope of government? Uh, the deficit is, is really just a ultimately a mismatch between what we're paying for government and the government that we're actually receiving. Yeah, I guess I guess it's 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 true like the the way people tend to frame the conversation for instance about social security, medicare and medicaid for instance is to say to say it's either a matter of either we fund these programs or we cut them uh, and it just doesn't actually talk about what these programs should look like if they're adapted to the to to the moment, if they still make sense, you know, for Social Security started like you know almost a hundred years, well, not a hundred years ago, but close. I mean, like, and we're not having these conversation. And it's particularly problematic in these mandatory programs that you mentioned. The the mandatory programs are Congress basically sets a formula or some criteria, and then the spending just happens more or less automatically. And and so the rather than having a discussion about what is the goal of these programs, how big should they be, it, are the formulas that were sent decades ago the correct way to be spending spending money, uh, th- those should all be the the. The conversations that that you have first, and then once you design a program, and once you there's sort of a decision on how big the program should be, how big it should be growing year over year, then you can talk about how how to fund it. But just saying we have this thing that is is growing and is unfunded, therefore we must raise taxes to cover the the gap between where we are and where we want to be. It misses misses the fundamental conversation of what should government be doing, how big how how big should these programs be, and and who should they be targeted towards. Another thing that I wanted to ask you is, let's say we've we've said people say no 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 we 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 want the size of government to be what it's like now, let's say 25% uh, of of GDP for spending. And we want to preserve Social Security exactly how it is, Medicare, Medicaid, right? Uh, What then should the conversation be about the reality of raising taxes in a sustainable manner, Right, because you want to do it over time. So, what what are the things that we 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 should be talking about and and keeping in mind while having that conversation? Well, I think first it's important to say that you can't keep if you decide you want uh, federal spending and, and taxation to be twenty five percent of GDP, uh, you you can't keep the current. Medicare and Social Security program. You still have to make reforms. The these these programs are projected to grow faster than the economy over time. And so, e- whatever level of government you ultimately decide on politically, uh, you still need to make reforms to these programs so that they so that they don't grow unsustainably over time. So there's a there's sort of a level conversation, a level of government, and and a and a growth rate conversation. I think once you once you separate those two pieces and make the re- make the reforms to spending growth, which is the sort of first piece that has to happen, whatever level of government you ultimately decide, if you decide you want a government that's 25 percent of of, G- of GDP, you need to increase taxes by uh, federal taxes by something like 40 percent on Americans at, at basically every every income level. You look at the way that the European Union funds their large social safety nets. Uh, it's with high taxes on people at every income level, poor people, middle class. Uh, the rich also pay quite, quite a bit of, bit of taxes. But th- this is not the conversation that we're having. Politicians sort of talk about the, these tax increases as something that someone else will, will pay for. And that's not the reality. To sustainably fund a big government, you need high taxes and you need them on everyone. And that's, and that's the reality that, that 
needs to be paired with any conversation of keeping government the size that it is. So are you saying that you can't, uh, you can't close the gap and pay for all of these programs at the current growth just by taxing the rich? Uh, no, you can't. You can't. Uh, the, the, currently, the federal tax system is already highly progressive. The top 10% of income earners pay something like 60% of all taxes and something like 75% of income taxes. Uh, and so in the highly sort of unlikely scenario in which Congress were to confiscate sort of every dollar earned over $500,000 a year, something that uh, con- like President Biden has said he doesn't want to raise taxes on the middle class. Um, you st- if you were to confiscate every dollar over $500,000 a year, you still can't cover projected deficits with unrealistic economic assumptions where these people continue to, to earn their, their they, they continue to actively produce things and contribute to the economy. Uh, and so the, the reality is that if we don't reduce spending, uh, you have to increase taxes on on basically everyone uh, eventually, and that's the that that's the cost, and that's that's the flip side of this conversation that I wish people were a little bit more upfront about. Yeah, I mean, I it's I think people don't realize how much more regressive taxes are, for instance, in Europe. So, and I went and checked. In France, for instance, the uh, the top marginal rate, fly, which is forty five percent, it applies to income uh, above one hundred seventy, let's say, thousand euros, right? So that's kind of probably roughly two hundred thousand dollars. It used to be much lower, but they've actually increased the product. Uh, progressivity, but then they have they have a, a tax, a flat tax, uh, which is roughly seven nine point seven percent on almost all gross salaries. So that's very regressive. And then you have the payroll tax, which is twenty percent. That too is very regressive. Then you have a value added tax which too is very regressive. And so they're just, and then they have fees. They have over 300 different types of fees that apply on top of each other. And so it just, it's remarkably, remarkably uh, regressive compare, compared to the U.S., yeah, that, that's exactly right. You're sort of across the you're the average European country, uh, middle class taxpayers pay something like sixteen thousand dollars more in taxes each year. And that's more than fifty percent of their income. Lower income taxpayers something like six thousand dollars more, and more than forty five percent of their income. And they do that with, as you as you note, across sort of all of these countries, they tend to have an average value added tax rate of twenty percent. They have income taxes where the top marginal rate which is quite high, reaches all the way down into your your uh, your average uh, income earner. And uh, and then they also have payroll high payroll taxes uh, often on, on top of all of that. And so the to to sustainably fund large uh, high levels of government spending, uh, that's that's the way that's the way every other country does it. Uh, and so if that's the direction that that some people want to move the United States, I, that we should be we should be leading with with the with those costs uh, because those are they're they're large and they're not just money coming out of your pocket but they also come with large uh, significant economic uh, consequences uh, in, in a bunch of different areas of life. But you know what's more striking though is like uh, with very rare exceptions. They're not, they're these countries that have very, very regressive taxes, or at least more regressive taxes than we have, and much higher taxes than we have. It's not as if they're in the, they're not in the red. They too have very large deficits. I mean, certainly it's true for France, Italy, and, and many European nations. So let's talk about why that is. So let's say that we're all on board to say, well, well revenue is going to have to be on the table. Uh, we're going to we're going to raise taxes. Uh, it seems that when people say this, they assume that basically that will solve the problem. Is that is that true? Uh, n- no, you're exactly right. The the sort of high levels of of government of government taxation do not. Uh, nest, do not mean that you don't have budget deficits and, and growing debt. Uh, usually, higher taxes are associated with with higher spending and a desire for spending to always be higher than the amount of revenue that that you're bringing in. 
In the U.S. context, the uh, economist Richard Vedder in the 1990s did some sort of seminal work showing that federal tax revenue, sort of te- federal tax increases in the United States, a one dollar tax increase is associated with about a buck sixty of increased federal spending. Uh, looking over the sort of post World War II period, that association actually has gotten stronger over time. And so, what this tells us is that historically, tax increases don't actually uh, fix. Uh, don't actually fix deficits or debt. They can make them worse uh, for a variety of reasons. Sort of the two main ones are that politicians, if you're uh, charging people more, there's a there's a cost you're putting on people. There's an incentive to uh, to sort of bring home additional benefits and increase spending to compensate. Uh, but also tax increases are are recessionary and contra- are contractionary. And those uh, and so tax increases can also make budgets worse by uh, triggering automatic stabilizers and other sort of new new additional spending that wasn't there in in the first place. So basically, we have to be skeptical about the notion of raising taxes to reduce a deficit if we haven't actually fixed the incentives that led us to be in this mess in the first place. It seems like that's what you're that's what you're saying. What about what about the balanced approach, right? This notion that's something that we heard a lot during the Obama years about, you know what, let's make a deal. We're gonna raise one dollar for each dollar of uh taxes we raise, we're gonna cut spending. Does that work? So the I think the evidence uh, of sort of successful fiscal adjustments, successful uh, plans that that address unsustainable budget deficits and, and unsustainably growing uh, debt to GDP is is that no, this sort of balanced approach or even a tax heavy approach is not uh, are, historically have not been successful. The Harvard economist uh, Alberto Sina and a bunch of different co-authors, including I think yourself, uh, have have looked at how countries have attempted to reduce budget deficits and debt to GDP ratios um, over time across a bunch of different countries. And his research basically comes to two conclusions. One, plans that rely primarily on tax increases uh, tend to lead to deep and prolonged recessions, and they fail to stabilize debt to GDP. Plans that primarily rely on spending cuts uh, are much more often uh, successful at stabilizing debt levels and are significantly less recessionary than their tax-based plans. Uh, and so uh, the the lesson from this is that the tax increases themselves are, are sort of self-defeating. By slowing the economy, it's harder to raise the projected revenue. But also on the spending side, the, the bu- most budget crises are not triggered simply by sort of a stable uh, gap between revenue and spending, but a widening gap between the two. And so most uh, most countries, including in the, the the U.S. context right now, the the budget the instability is driven by by spending growth and a fiscal adjustment that doesn't address that growth rate. The growth rate in spending as the primary primary mechanism. Uh, simply doesn't address the underlying problem and therefore can't um, can't fix the the budget crisis. You know, one of the things that I thought was interesting in that literature about looking at fiscal adjustment around across countries, uh, and the one that have actually done it successfully and managed to reduce it, their debt to GDP ratio, is that they found that the kind of it's also not any spending, right? You're not going to be uh, successful by targeting like cutting all of your discretionary spending that's you know your your education you know uh, uh, foreign aid and, and things like this it's like if I remember the work by uh, Kevin Hassett and uh, Andrew Biggs at, at AI they said it was it was what we call social transfer in the American context it's entitlement so effectively what this research is saying is stating the obvious is that you should be targeting first the driver the drivers of your future debt. Exactly. And so you're pointing to, in the U.S. context right now, more than 100% of the non-interest spending growth is due to mandatory spending, these automatic programs. And so if a if a fiscal adjustment package doesn't address those programs and the unsustainable growth there, then you're not addressing the problem. So you're not fixing it. You're not fixing anything. You might kick the can down the road a couple of years, but without addressing the the growth rate in spending, the thing that's actually making the budget unsustainable, you're you're not uh, you're not able to to fix the problem. 
And so that's you're exactly you're right. That's borne out sort of time and time again across across different countries. Another thing that I I think it's worth pointing out, and um, it's kind of depressing, is the fact that when you look at the countries that have implemented fiscal adjustment and those that have been successful, I mean that that proportion is is very uh, small. And if I remember correctly, I don't know the numbers haven't been updated, but it was like. 80% of the countries that engage in fiscal adjustment uh, in the name of reducing their debt to GDP ratio failed. Uh, they, they, it, was a, it was a failure and they did not uh, succeed. And in part, it's because they went about it the wrong way. So how do you, how do you explain? I mean, that, that these politicians are setting out to do something that's going to be painful. I mean, raising taxes is painful. That's why a lot of people don't want to talk about it. Uh, or actually, the Democrats talk about it a lot, but really, effectively, they, they don't really do it. So what's going on there? The fact that most of these plans are ultimately not successful is uh, is clear in the fact that we still have large budget deficits and most countries struggle with these with this type of fiscal imbalance over time if it was easy to to raise taxes in the right way or cut spending in the right way then we wouldn't be sort of we wouldn't be the united states wouldn't be here and other countries wouldn't be struggling with this this same issue so it really gets i think that the high failure rate gets to the difficulty of of the problem and and you're right it makes it even more difficult because uh, because the the things that are driving our budget instability are the thing are the some of the more popular programs that uh, that politicians are don't uh, struggle to talk about how how to reform uh, and and the sort of easy fixes like spend like tax increases are are often not sold um, to people in an honest way it's sold as just a tax increase on the rich, or there's this one easy one easy fix of a wealth tax or whatever it might be that that will make everything work, and that's also just simply not the case. And so the, the it's the it, it is a really difficult problem, uh, and there's really no honest brokers t- telling people that uh, sort of what the fiscal reality is that that we have big government right now, but we're paying for government that's significantly smaller. And if we're gonna pay for big government, we need high taxes on everyone. There's, there's sort of costs to everything. And, uh, and ultimately, we're not having that conversation. So I wonder also whether in the end, you know, if we don't try to think about this fiscal adjustment issues without having first addressed the institutional or special interest problem that put us in this mess in the in the in the first place, uh, we really risk. Even if there's there's political will to do something, we're going to those decisions. The political decisions are still taking place within the same structure, with those same special interests that are going to say, you know what? Why don't you actually do a balanced approach as opposed to you know, have a conversation about reforming uh, entitlement programs. This is my concern when people say revenues should be on the table. As someone that I think it's beyond as someone that's just uh, I, uh, ideologically uh, and sort of is the right policy path. I think that government should be small, significantly smaller than it is. Uh, but setting that aside, starting with with revenues is misses the point. In, in two very critical ways. The first is this issue of what's actually driving the budget crisis, and that's that's the growth rate of, of spendings. Like that, if that's not the first conversation you're having, then then you're doing it wrong. And the and then the second issue is historically most tax increases don't actually fix uh, fix the prop the the problem the budget deficit. And so without thinking really clearly about what the mechanism is to actually constrain spending and to ensure that those spending cuts actually actually happen over the long run then uh, that we're missing the point and so any co- that, that any conversation needs to start on the spending side in, in in my view and and with a conversation of of what is our ultimate goal is our ultimate goal to sort of 
sustain the current uh, large federal government we have, or is it to make sort of broader reforms and ensure that the government isn't continuing to grow out of control? And then, of course, we haven't really talked about this, is the impact of raising taxes on the economy. How, how do you think about this? What do you think are that the taxes that really, really should not be on the table or some of the tax reforms that, uh, that we should be thinking of or how, we, how should we be thinking about this? Sort of academic literature over and over and over again shows that tax increases have a no- negative uh, effect on economic growth across the board. The, so we know that, that raising taxes uh, makes people worse off, um, not just by taking more of their paycheck, but also by reducing the job opportunities and wage growth and sort of broader economic, uh, uh, economic mobility. Often the, the tax increases that are floated as ways to fix the budget deficit, especially from uh, folks on the left, are the most economically dam- damaging taxes. So their taxes, the uh, their taxes, higher taxes on corporations, on businesses. There are higher taxes on on investment income. There are taxes on on wealth, which is not just stuffed in a, a sort of mattress somewhere, but that wealth is actively invested in the economy in the form of uh, sort of you name your your business like that is someone's the investment there is someone's wealth, and so taxing either the returns on those investments more heavily or or the stock of investment in the economy means that we're going to have fewer uh, innovations in the future. We're going to have less uh, business growth and less uh, productivity growth for, for workers, which is ultimately what drives wage wage increases. And, and that's clear across different types of tax increases and, and over time. And so the this is more than just a conversation about how to balance the budget. But if tax increases are indeed on the table, sort of what is the economic cost that we're willing we're willing to bear. And uh, and so that's uh, sort of the another incredibly important piece of the conversation. But let, let me ask you a question. Are let's say someone isn't as preoccupied about economic growth as you and I are. And and one of the reasons why I'm really actually exercised about economic growth is not just because it actually is is important because it there's no more powerful way to lift people out of poverty, but it's also because of, of the impact, the social impact that the lack of economic economic growth has. I mean, this is what brings out tribalism, lack of tolerance, and all of that stuff. So that's one of the reasons why I care about it. But let's say someone doesn't care that much about it and says, you know what, I'm willing to actually sacrifice some economic growth to raise revenue, to say like we're gonna really raise the corporate income tax, we're gonna, we're gonna implement a wealth tax, and then we're gonna raise revenue. What do you say to that person? I think implicit in in that story that you told that raising taxes shrinks the economy, it uh, it 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 tells me that you're not going to be successful at at balancing the budget with tax increases that you think shrink the the size of the economy, the things that that you're ultimately trying to tax. Uh, and so, for many of the, way, the reasons that we've already discussed, tax increases don't actually address, don't aren't actually well suited to address the budget deficit. And one of those ways ways is that they do have a negative effect on economic growth and make it harder to raise the revenue that sort of you would otherwise think you would get. Isn't isn't the corporate income tax kind of actually one of the worst tax to raise? Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's certainly one of the uh, it's. Uh, economists sort of across the board generally agree that the corporate income tax is the most economically harmful. Even sort of economists from across from the OECD, which is a proponent right now of raising uh, corporate taxes, have 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 done multiple studies that show that if you were to rank taxes by economic cost, the corporate income tax is the most most costly. And uh, and I think the, the, ultimately that's because the corporation itself doesn't pay the tax. It it gets passed on to to people, either workers or consumers or investors. And a large the majority of the tax gets passed on to investors, meaning they invest less. And uh, and so the people that those businesses employ and the wages that those businesses pay are all negatively impacted. That's you're make you're making like a super important point here. And let me see if I if I 
got you correctly, you seem to be saying that the taxpayer who writes the check isn't necessarily the one that actually shoulders the economic burden of the tax, that there's a difference between the two. And then it seems to be, uh, it's imp- it's, you seem to be saying that actually, in a lot of ways, those who are populist and think that going after corporations is a good idea are missing the point that workers are going to be hurt. Yeah, the the sort of legal incidence of the tax, who actually writes the check, is often different than the economic incidence, who actually pays the, 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 the cost of the tax in both lower wages or, or, or directly, but also in broader sort of econo- broader economic costs. And so in the case of the corporate income tax, uh, generally speaking, the sort of the estimates are about uh, somewhere between half and 75 percent of the cost of the corporate tax is actually paid by workers in the form of lower wages. The other example is the payroll tax. Legally, it's half paid by the employer, half paid by the employee. But most people agree that Almost all of that, if not all of the, uh, that tax, is is paid by the worker in the form of lower wages because the employer passes the cost the the cost on. And so, anytime we're we're trying to sort of design a tax system that 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 <laughs> that, that taxes one thing or another, it's we shouldn't be looking at, ex- at at who's paying writing the check, but ultimately what the broader economic costs are. And unfortunately, those costs usually fall on uh, on sort of your average working American and not the sort of the boogeyman of the rich or the big powerful corporation. So to kind of to sum up um, this conversation, what would you say to, I guess, free market uh, um, advocates and conservatives or libertarians who are aware that a political compromise is going to require to put taxes on the table, as they say, uh, what would you say to them if they just simply state that tax increases will have to be part of any sustainable package as a matter of economics or budget math? What's what's your message? So it it I think it, it's eminently possible to balance the budget uh, without without tax increases. It's just a matter of of, of politics. What the uh, sort of where what what mix they end up settling on. So as uh, as an economist and a sort of someone that that uh, that observe that isn't in the it isn't a politician making the compromises, but is doing sort of just uh, uh, policy analysis. We should we should be clear that there's nothing uh, in economics or budget math that says taxes. Uh, have to be on the table or a specific amount of tax revenue is necessary to fix this problem. It goes back to we don't want to confuse the deficit the deficit conversation with the size of the go- of government conversation. Ultimately, I if you think government should remain rel- uh, relatively small and not grow in perpetuity over time, we should be focusing on spending on spending first. and uh, and that's that's where the conversation need needs to be. if, the conversation turns to to tax increases or how how much higher taxes need to be. We need to be clear about what type of taxes actually make that sustainable, and and be clear with people that there are are real real costs there. But it's ultimately not the the role of of an economist to to make the sort of political trades that ultimately will may or may not have to uh, come to pass. Plus, what I'm getting from uh, what you've said, but I mean. Is, is the fact that actually raising more revenue is really hard, right? I mean, people seem to be talking in a vacuum as if, you know, the fact that we don't have more revenues than we have is not a matter of, of uh, constraint, economic constraints, or it's, it's a matter of political will. If only we raise taxes, we, we'd have more revenue. But it seems that from everything you, you're saying, it's actually really hard to be able to raise more revenue in the current tax system, at least. Correct. Within the current tax system we have, it is uh, it is difficult to raise significantly more revenue than we currently have. There's revenue has been relatively stable over time, uh, fluctuating around seventeen and a half percent. We got up to twenty percent once, but came down pretty quickly after that. Uh, the uh, 
so the reality is that if you want to raise significantly more taxes, you need to add entirely new tax systems into the mix that are that tax many more Americans uh, than than currently pay, like the income tax, for example. And those look like value added taxes or carbon taxes, things that have the ability to raise a, a bunch more revenue. But the the there's costs with those too not just economic costs, but as we keep coming back to, they tend to fuel additional government growth. And there's there's not just the, the Richard Vedder work, but there's some a bunch of public choice work showing that the introduction of value-added taxes and value-added tax increases actually lead to additional spending increases as well, fueling government growth over time. And so, again, it comes back to what is the appropriate size and scope of government first and foremost, and the revenue conversation sort of needs to follow uh, behind that. What about tax code efficiency? I mean, it seems to me that we used to talk a lot about what good tax reform looks like, and we're not, we're not doing that much of that anymore. Yet, it, one argument uh, could be that engaging in, in, um, in tax reform uh, would could lead to a much more efficient government and 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 generate some revenues. Is that wrong? So uh, there is ample opportunity to make reforms to the current system we have. There's uh, a sort of annually something like a trillion dollars of quote unquote tax expenditures in the in the tax code that many of which could be eliminated to help offset the, uh, again, uh, quote unquote, costs of reducing marginal tax rates. And that would, we know that it's the mar marginal tax rates that, ha that impact people's behavior. And so you can get a lot of efficiency gains out of our system by going after true tax loopholes and using those savings to offset additional reforms to things like the corporate income tax and the capital gains tax and top marginal income tax rates. Those trade-offs are really challenging. We made some progress in 2017 by uh, by simplifying the tax code and using some of those those savings to help offset some of the costs of lower lower marginal rates, like the state and local tax, like the deduction. state and local tax deduction, some limits on the mortgage interest deduction, things that are politically popular and difficult to put constraints on, but uh, but ultimately those are the types of things that are necessary to help increase the economic efficiency of the of the system overall and and there's a big opportunity in 2025 uh, and in 2026 is when taxes automatically increase and a lot of these tax cuts expire so in 2025 Congress is going to have a, a really tremendous opportunity to make additional efficiency improvements to the tax code by going after additional uh, true loopholes and subsidies in the tax code and using those savings to 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 keep tax rates uh, low that's a just like the sort of budget issue we've been discussing about that will be a politically difficult sort of tight rope to walk but it's possible and there's a lot of really great reforms that are laying on the table that can uh, that can make that can grow the economy uh, and and ultimately uh, sort of improve the way that Americans interact with the tax system. Do you know what I find interesting also is we're often having these conversations as if um, the only ones who are uh, against raising taxes are Republicans, conservative, libertarians. But isn't it the case? I mean, it seems Democrats, when given an opportunity to actually raise taxes, they're just, they, they're not too eager either, right? Well, this is uh, by the uh, President Biden has his uh, four hundred thousand dollar pledge. He's not going to raise taxes on anyone um, that earns under four hundred thousand dollars a year. That implicitly uh, bakes in the extension of uh, a lot, like t uh, two thirds, maybe ninety percent of the of the twenty seventeen Trump tax cuts. So the the sort of political secret is that Republicans and Democrats both favor trillions of dollars of, of tax cuts over the next decade. And so the it, it just makes these budget conversations that much more challenging because there's no political will to tell people that they're currently receiving a government that is significantly more expensive than what they're being charged. And it's that mismatch and the, the 
the inability to for from politicians to to sort of honestly talk about these issues that makes any of these reforms on the tax side or the spending side uh, so challenging. So in 2017, uh, I mean, I think it's no secret that I like a small, small government. And, and it's also probably no secret that I won't be getting the government I want anytime soon. But I thought I thought in 2017, it was an enormous mistake uh, for these tax uh, cuts to pass without offsetting them with, uh, with spending cuts uh, or closing some tax expenditures. Or, or, and I just thought, not just because we were bound to kind of have to pay a price for it, if economically, but also uh, politically, I think it's. I, I thought politically it was just a big, big mistake. So, what what do you think is the most important thing for Republicans and those who are going to be pushing for um, the extension of the uh, expiring provisions uh, in of, of the the 2017 tax cut in? 2025, I think it, it is, with a caveat that I actually think that most Democrats are going to want to ex- extend most of these tax cuts. What's, what's your advice? Uh, what's your warning to, uh, to those Republicans, conservative, uh, pushing for the extension of these uh, tax cuts? Well, I think the, the point, point you, you slid in there is, is really important to reiterate is most of the expiring tax cuts have bipartisan support and that and ultimately the political consensus will be most of them should be should be extended uh, the the distinction that I think is important to make is the difference between tax reform and tax cuts uh, you can keep taxes low by by making additional reforms to the to the system by further putting limits on the state and local tax deduction by uh, by by uh, eliminating the rest of the itemized deductions for for individuals by not expanding the the child tax credit. These are all things that you can do to help offset keeping tax rates low in a way that is fiscally sustainable. And so, the, if we ultimately want to keep taxes low, we have to address we have to address the spending side. The uh, if, like the true level of taxation is the level of spending, and ultimately taxes are going to have to rise to meet that level of spending at, at some point in in the future. And so if we truly care about keeping taxes low on, on Americans, then we have to be talking about cutting spending. Otherwise, any any tax cut that that uh, that is passed through Congress will sort of by necessity be temporary and, and ultimately not have the benefits that we would otherwise hope uh, for uh, from, a, from a true tax cut that sort of that right size to the size of government. So is your advice to those engaged in these conversation to um, be demanding offsets? Yeah, we can't we can't continue to cut uh, cut taxes without making without without making spending reforms. And, uh, and and other reforms in in the tax code, uh, it's just simply not not sustainable. I think that that doesn't mean we can't have tax reform, continuing to make economic uh, efficiency improvements in the tax system, but we certainly can't be continuing to increase spending and decrease revenue. Um, that's a recipe for sort of fiscal disaster. Yeah. Now, this will be my last question. What do you think the tax system will look like and our fiscal situation will look like in, let's say, 25 years? Do you think we will still be operating within the same tax system or do you think it is inevitable that they will have given up and just decided to add more taxes? Well, I think there's, my my hope is that you and I and the rest of the sort of uh, folks that, uh, that, believe in smaller government are successful and can and politicians realize that they need to constrain the growth rate of spending and the size of the federal government should ultimately remain uh, s- uh, small rather than uh, growing perpetually. My fear is that that is politically difficult and when you hit a, some, a big fiscal crisis, the first lever that 
politicians want to pull is uh, is the tax lever, uh, is higher taxes. As you pointed out in the Alicina work, the uh, most of these fiscal adjustments have a bunch of tax increases in them, which ultimately make them less successful. And so the uh, my hope is that we buck that trend and that we are successful at um, as sort of right sizing the federal government, but my fear, uh, as I think you alluded to, is that the is that Congress will muddle their way through and not actually constrain the growth rate of spending, and they'll eventually have to find sort of new novel revenue sources, and will look increasingly like Europe, both in our tax system, but also our our slow growth rate and sort of anemic job market. And also, I mean, there it's significant to actually look at how much poorer. They are, they are than we are. Yeah, and that's a fact. That's a that's a product of slower growth. Exactly. Um, and uh, that is driven by a bunch of policy choices. One of which is uh, is a sort of anti growth tax regime. So well, let's hope that you and I and uh, others are successful in, in kind of reminding people that they are uh, the reason why we're opposing uh, putting taxes on the table is not because we're rabid ideologues, though. I am, but, uh, but it is because actually it's just not as easy as they think and it will backfire. So thanks, Adam. I think this was important information. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I think this is a really important conversation and one that we're going to continue to have until Congress gets their act together and actually addresses some of these underlying problems. Thank you. 